chapter 39, as promised, not promised, said, stated, Psalms chapter 39 tonight, right there about the middle of your Bible, Psalms 39, just want to remind everybody that as we're preaching through the book of Psalms, Psalms is a very emotional book, if you read it, it is, it is a lot of, the psalmists are usually enthralled in emotions, and what this helps us to understand is that God understands our emotions. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're coming, where we're coming from. And so Psalm 39, uh, this is a Psalm of David, of course. It says that he gave it to a musician. I am not even going to try to say that name. I am not confident enough that I'd get it right. It's like Ju Judithan? Judithan. Jedithan. I don't know. Uh, he gave it to a musician uh, to put it to music, and the Israelites would have sang this. But many people believe, or many theologians believe, I should say, chapter 38, chapter 39, and chapter 40 all kind of go together. Now, we have no proof of that. They could have been written 20 years apart for all we know. Uh, but the, the theme in them does kind of carry, and you'll kind of see if you were here last week or if you go back and listen to that message in conjunction with this leak. And so here David deals with really the re reality of the brevity of life, the briefness of life. He, he realizes that. And so let's stand together for the reading of God's word. We're going to read the whole chapter, and uh, Lord will bless it. I, verse number 1, Psalms 39, I said... I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrows was my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days. What is it that I may know how frail I am? Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is nothing before thee. Every, or verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Vanity being empty. He's saying at his very best, man is nothing. <laughs> well stated, David. I agree. Selah. Verse 6. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord... What wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. Remove thy strokes away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou with rebukes dost, dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord. And give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace from my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. Oh, spare me, that I may recover strength before I go hence, and be no more. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless the time in your word. Uh, be with the folks here, that you'd open up their hearts to the truth of it. And Lord, be with me as I preach it, empty me of self, and with the Holy Spirit, allow me to uh, say only what you'd have me to say. Really fill me uh, for this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing titled this message, Holding My Tongue. Holding My Tongue. Time flies. That has been the theme of my house lately, it seems like. Uh, you know, Brody turning one on the seventh is like, oh man, he's one already. And Izzy turning five last month is like, my goodness, how is she five already? And then me turning 30 last year, I'm going, how am I? I'm not 30. I can't be 30. Seriously, 30? No. And so it's, it kind of just be, seems to be the theme of our life. But really, time wouldn't fly if we lived for thousands of years. Time wouldn't fly if we lived for thousands of years. If, if we lived to be around 2,000 years old, 30 years wouldn't really matter, would it? No, that wouldn't even be a, that wouldn't even be a 20th. So we wouldn't even think about it. Not, not even the 10th. It's, it's not a big deal. It's just 30 years. But because I might live 80 years on this earth, which I promise I probably won't. I, I cannot. I mean, it's up to the Lord, and I honor and respect my parents, but I'm telling you, there's, I, I, I have done too much to my body to really live that long. But it, 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 because I may only live about 80 years, 70, 75, 80 years in this world, 90 years, you know, maybe, because of that, 30 years sounds like a lot. It's a chunk of it. That's either almost, you know, a third of it or, or maybe more. So really what we're saying is not that time flies, it's that life is short. It's really what we're saying is when we say, man, time flies, what we're really saying is life is short. To think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to the halfway point. If I live to be 80, it's scary. 
Life is short. Some of y'all are going, Pastor, you got no idea. 30 is nothing. <laughs> David was struggling with that truth in our passage. He had to learn to accept that human life is but a vanishing breath. But he realized that for a reason. So let's look back to the psalm. It really breaks into four stanzas. I didn't break it into four stanzas for my notes. Uh, so if, if, if you want those later, come find me. But really, first, David states that he would keep his mouth shut when the wicked were around. Look at verse number one. And I said, this is what David said. He said, I said, I will take heed to my ways. That I sin not with my tongue, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Now, just a little context because we didn't do it before. But at this point, similarly to chapter 38, David is under the, uh, the correction, the loving fatherly correction of God. He is being disciplined for a sin. Now, some people speculate that 38, 39, 40 were written around the time we committed sin with Bathsheba. But really, there's tons of sins that could have been the cause of this psalm being written. He doesn't specify, so we can just speculate. Uh, but I'll tell you this. David wasn't perfect. He may have been a man after God's own heart, but he did a whole lot more than just sin with Bathsheba. So it could have been any, uh, any number of sin. I do believe he was king at this point, And so I would say this is at least why he was a king. Uh, but so uh, with all that going on, with, with, with God punishing him for his sins, in the midst of that, David determines, all right, I'm going to pay attention to my life. That's what he says at the very, very beginning. I said, I will take heed to my ways. I'm really going to pay attention to what I do. By the way, it's a good idea to pay attention to what you do. <laughs> you, that, that, I mean, don't just go around doing anything and everything. Pay attention to what you're doing. But really, here's, here was his determination. That when the wicked were around, he was going to hold his tongue. Here's what he says. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Right before that, it says that I sin not with my tongue. Now, that's a tall order. James says it's impossible in ourselves to control our tongue. It, it, we, we can't. Sometimes I understand. I can't even control my tongue in the pulpit sometimes. And David says, I'm, gonna, I'm determined. I, I'm a, like a bridle. Think of a bridle like a, in a horse's mouth that you control the horse. He says, I'm going to bridle my tongue. And it, at least while the wicked is around me. Now, that's a good idea. It was wise. Let me encourage you. Complaining about what God is doing in your life. If it's discipline, that is. If you're under sin and God's punishing you for that. Complaining about that to unsaved people is not going to help them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you, uh, if you go to a recruiter, a, a military recruiter, you show up at the recruitment, they don't tell you all the, the bad stuff they're going to do to you in the army. <laughs> they don't tell you about the bad stuff they're going to do in the military. What do they tell you? They, well, free tuition for college. Oh, you know, the, the retirement, pension, this, that. They don't tell you about a, D, a drill sergeant yelling in your face and, and waking up at five and have to run for miles and, and have to endure. They don't tell you those things. Why? Because, well, if you want to get somebody into something, don't tell them all the bad. Now, the reality of it is, um, the reason why David was in a bad spot was because he sinned. And praise the Lord that when we are complaining that God, if we ever do in our hearts, complain that God is punishing us for something we did, at least we know he loves us. I look back to the times my parents punished me and I'm like, well, I'm glad they were there to punish me. I'm, I'm glad I got in trouble for sneaking out because it helped me not do it as much. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I got in trouble for saying certain things. Taught me to not say certain things, at least in front of my parents. I'm glad that they cared. But keeping your mouth shut when you're frustrated is hard to do. Yeah. It's hard to do. Have you ever been in a frustrating situation and you were just thinking, either it's somebody or a situation, you finally go, that's it, I can't keep my tongue any longer, I can't keep my mouth shut, I've got to say something. I feel like that was like a chunk of my vacation. <laughs> you, like, I'm listening to, to uh, siblings, I won't name names, but I'm listening to siblings complain about their finances. I'm like, you just went and spent $22 on coffee, you bonehead. I don't want to hear about your finances being tight. Right. You know, I, I, I listen to my, my siblings say something about parenting or say something about this. And I'm like, hold your tongue. Keep it shut. Keep it shut. Keep it shut. Let somebody else say something. That's exactly how David felt. This is what he says in verse number two. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. He kept quiet, but his pent up emotions were stirred up. He said, I, I'm keeping my mouth shut, but I'm telling you, I'm, I'm feeling it. In, I'm hot in here. I may not have said it, but in here, I'm hot. I am ready to, to yell. I'm ready to scream. I'm ready to get mad. But notice he says he held his peace from even good. Meaning he wasn't talking bad about God in front of the wicked, but he also wasn't praising the Lord either. He wasn't saying the bad things, but he wasn't saying the good things. That's a recipe for, for, for trouble. 
Often when we're not praising God, it is because we sin and he is punishing us and we get upset about it. Ultimately, it's our fault because we did wrong, but we're still getting mad at him. And so we're not going to praise God. And if you've ever been around somebody that says, well, I just don't, we even talked about it on uh, Sunday night. I don't remember. Sunday night, Sunday morning, kind of blurring my mind because it's all one big preaching whirlwind. But we talked about the joylessness that some people have and, and a Christian walking in. You know, probably the reality of why they're just moping in and they're not very excited, they're not very happy, and they're not very uh, uh, with it. You know why? Probably because God is punishing them for their sins and that makes them mad at God and they're not going to praise Him because they're mad at Him. And so they come in here thinking, I don't really have a reason to praise God. When the reality is, you, your first number one reason to praise God is that He's punishing you. That means He loves you. That means you're His child. There's many kids that I've seen in grocery stores that needed a pat on the back or maybe one a little lower. But they weren't my kids, so I didn't. But my kids, I will punish. So if God's punishing, that's the first reason to praise, but they don't even see that. All they focus on is God is a, I'm not getting what I want. Bad things are happening to me. God seems to be punishing me. What is going on? And David said, man, as long as you're punishing me, I'm not praising you either. In verse 3, we see he was compelled to speak. He finally couldn't hold it in. He says, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. He's painting a picture of something kind of like a volcano. That's ready to erupt. It's boiling to the surface. He's everything, everything is, I mean, he's, he's, he's done good. He's, he's kept his mouth shut. He may not have said anything good, but he sure hasn't said anything bad either. And, and, and his position, sometimes in leadership, you got to learn to just bite your tongue and not say bad things either. But he says, finally, I'm going to blow. And when he does, quote unquote, blow, he vents to the right person. God. Verse number four starts with Lord. So before we even get into verse 4, but Lord, he, he is going to vent to the right person. Now, I, I, I'm for if you want to talk to somebody. I'm for you wanting to talk to me maybe or another. Uh, I, would, I would argue a mature Christian. Don't just go talking to anybody about your frustrations, especially if it's with God or whatever God's doing in your life. Uh, there are certain people I'd say, yeah, don't, don't go talk to them. They're not going to help you. We're also going to talk about that on uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> the, the passage is about how to help people. So I mean, it's, 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 we're going to talk about it. Uh, but I, I'm for people wanting to talk to me. But the reality is... Even at my best, as your pastor, I can't love you and care about you as much as God can. Your spouse can't love and care for you as much as God can. Other, other church members cannot love and care for you as much as God can. And none of them can do anything that God without God. So you might as well just go to the source. Here's what he said in verse number four. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Now that's a mouthful to basically say this. God, show me how short my life really is. How much longer do I even have on this earth? So what do you want to, now, oh, I think every one of us would sign up if we could know how much longer we got. I would live life differently no matter what the answer was. If God said you have 50 more years, I'd be making different decisions. If he said you had 20 more years, I'll be making different decisions. No matter what, I know I would change things in my life. If I had five minutes, I'm not changing anything. I'm going to just keep preaching because either I'm going to die with like an aneurysm or a heart attack right here, or we're all getting taken hopefully and in the rapture. And so I'm, I'm fine with that. But David's saying basically this, God, I want to know how long my life is. I'm, I'm miserable right now. You're punishing me. I know my life is frail. I prove how frail it is. Tell me how long I have to live. David asked God to teach him this because he realizes that God has made life brief and frail. Our lives on this earth, no matter how long you live, really is nothing compared to eternity. And David realized that our age is nothing compared to God. That's really what he stated. As you continue on in verse number four, he says, behold, thou hast made my days as in hand breath and mine age is nothing before thee. I, I imagine at this point, David may not have been an old man, but he would have been a mature grown man. He's king of Israel. I think to myself, he was probably uh, well versed in a lot of things. He was a skilled man. And he's thinking, really my age to you, God is nothing. My age to you is nothing before barely every man at his best state is altogether vanity. It's all, every man is empty at our very best. Our lives are very empty, short and fleeting. Now that you say, well, man, that's not exactly encouraging. <laughs> no way. We'll, we'll get to the encouraging part. No matter what you do to advance in this world, it doesn't change how empty your life could be or can be. Look at verse six. He says, surely every man walketh in a vain show. <laughs> Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not to whom, or 
knoweth not who shall gather them. David said, even, even, it is even vain if someone chases being busy or rich. Really, it's all vain. God, it's vain. By the way, I can't help but read this and not think of his son Solomon who came to the same conclusion just maybe 40, 50, 60 years later. I'm like, man, how come Solomon didn't read this or sing this? He, may have, he must have probably sang it at some point, but he didn't realize it because he goes chases all the things his dad said are all vain. That his dad had come to the same conclusion that he will come to. By the way, it's, your, your parents usually have come to the, the conclusions before you. So it's not bad to ask advice from your parents if they're still alive. I still, uh, no matter what, my dad will always be about 21 years ahead of me. 22 years ahead of me. No matter how old I get, he's always about 22 years ahead of me. Kind of drives me nuts. <laughs> David said, it is even vain if someone chases being busy or riches, but it's all vain. It's a good spot to tell you that the only things that we do, only the things we do for Christ will matter in this life or afterwards. Only the things we do for Christ. You can chase money. Or you can chase it. And you can even get it. But the reality is none of that's going to do what you think it's going to do for you. I love the quote from Jim Carrey who said, I wish everybody could be rich and famous so they could realize it all doesn't mean anything. You can chase knowledge. Oh man, I've got this degree and I'm going here and I'm doing this. I'm getting this. Th it's not, it's not going to do anything for you in the long term. You can chase power. Man, I'm going to rise up the, the corporate ladder. I'm going to be respected. I'm going to have prestige. People are going to listen to me. I'm going to have authority. Not really going to matter. You can chase love. By the way, that's what some people think they're living for. Living for love. Well, that's all good and well for you, but I'm living for love. Have fun with that. Say, so, well, it's love is love, love is great. I'm not I'm not saying love. I love my wife. I love my kids. I'm glad. I love my church. I love you guys. I, I, there's love in my life, but if I was living just for those things, I'd find it all empty. In the end, none of those will matter. So, what are you living for? What are you living for? If it is like David said, where he said, "All these things are vain. My life is vain. It's short. It's fleeting." If your life is just as short and fleeting, by the way, your health can't be better than his. You say, "Well, we've got doctors now, and this and that." They don't have processed food. They didn't have, you know, they they were they were living natural, about as natural as God could let them live. He may not have looked as good though as me because uh, he could, he didn't have nice razors and the gym and stuff. But he was living naturally. <laughs> it was a joke. Some of y'all took me a little too seriously. I'm just kidding. Although, I don't know, maybe, I, I, I bet I'm taller, because <laughs> I'm not a, a Hebrew. 17% of men in this world are, are six feet tall and over, so I am in the 17th percentile in that, or the top 17% in height. Ha! And if you add blue eyes to that and blonde hair, I'm like, I'm like a unicorn. <laughs> you are welcome. Okay, anyways, back to what we're talking about. I don't know how we got off on all that. What are you living for tonight, I think was my point. <laughs> I really don't know how we got there. What are you living for? If, if, if you're living for all those things, you're going to realize, like David, that life is really frail and meaningless and empty. For whatever reason, I, I don't know what the sin was, but David chose what he wanted and to chase things of the world over what God wanted him to do. And he realized that doing this and the punishment that I'm dealing with, it's all empty. What are you living for? Now, uh, David asked the Lord to deliver him from his sins and its punishment so they might enjoy the rest of his life. Verses 7 through 13. I'll try to hurry. Oh, we're doing okay. I thought we were doing way worse than that. So we can make it worse. Here we go. Uh, a dramatic shift happens in verse number 7. He says, And now, Lord, what wait I for? What a realization. He's under the punishment of God. He says, all right, I'm going to mind my business. I'm going to pay attention to what I'm doing. I'm going to keep my tongue. I'm not going to say anything around uh, the wicked people. I'm just going to hold my tongue, but I'm also not going to say anything good. And he's, I'm just going to be quiet. But he's like, man, God just oh, finally blows up. He says, Lord, how long am I going to have to deal, go through all this? Life is frail. Life is empty. Even if I live uh, as long as I, I mean, I had, a hand's breadth to the Lord, it's nothing to you. And he gets so frustrated. And then he says, finally, it's like he came to himself halfway through a song. Have you ever come to yourself in a moment? Usually it does happen in prayer. There's been times I've been upset about something, a situation maybe in the church or something that I can't get to go right, and I'm praying, and all of a sudden it's like, ding, light bulb comes on, and I'm like, oh, never mind. Sorry. I'm an idiot. You knew that. Sorry. He came to himself. He says, what wait I for? And now, Lord, what, what wait I for? What am I, what am I waiting on? The next, the next five words here are important. My hope is in thee. 
My hope is in thee. What does he mean? My reliance is on thee. My expectation is from thee. It is not from what I see in this world. It is not from the power of solving mysteries which surround me. It is in God that made all, the ruler of all, and that can control all, and that can accomplish his own great purposes. My hope is in you. If anything besides the Lord is your hope, you'll be let down. Let's go to the most basic of, of this, salvation. If your hope to get to heaven is anything else than the Lord and through him, it's going to be a letdown. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I, I mean, I've been in church. I've been in church longer than you've been alive, pup. Well, giddy goo. It doesn't matter. Well, I've given. You, 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 you don't even know how much I've given to the church. Well, yippity you do da. What is it? Well, well, you don't understand. I've been a really good person. I mean, I've, I've done good things. I've been helpful. I've, 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 I've been a good person. And none of that will get you to heaven. And all of those things will lead you to the realization that none of it mattered. Right. Now, by the way, I'm for church attendance. I'm for giving to churches. I'm for doing good things. But if those are what you're relying on, if that is your hope for heaven, it's going to let you down. Right. It's going to let you down. So why is that? Because... God, God made it clear, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, that any man should boast. I can break that down really quick. For by grace, it is the grace of God, is him coming and dying on the cross for your sins. Him doing what you could never do. That's grace. Unmerited favor. He is showing you favor that you don't deserve because you're a sinner. If you want to argue about that, I'm a sinner too. If you want to keep arguing, my one-year-old knows what no means, and he ignores me. We are all born sinners. But because you are a sinner, you needed unmerited favor. You needed grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. You need to not hope in you, not hope in what you can do, not hope in some prayer uh, you prayed to a priest, or not some hope that some priest prayed, or not some hope in some baptism, or not some hope in some sprinkling, or not some hope in some great action, or not some hope in some weird feeling you got. It is faith in Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. And that not of yourselves, meaning it's nothing you can do in yourself. By the way, that means baptism. That means giving. That means church attendance. That means good things. That means trying to live a perfect life. None of those things are going to get you there. Not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works. Why? Why can't it be of works, God? Lest any man should boast. I don't think heaven would be a perfect place if we all got there and went, what would you do to get here? <laughs> well, here's what I did. I pastored Peakview Baptist Church for X amount of years. And uh, that's why I'm here. Well, that doesn't sound like heaven at all. No, heaven's going to be a place where we're all praising Jesus and we all realize that we're there praising God because of what Jesus did for us. That's the first and kind of most simple. It's, if your hope isn't in the Lord, it's going to fail you. But this, this really can go a lot of ways. If your hope for your marriage is in anything but the Lord, it's going to fail. <laughs> Pastor, we're just, I don't know why this keeps, We're just living on love. You don't understand the way she makes me feel. You don't understand the way he makes me feel. Well, what happens when he stops making you feel that way? Oh, he'll never. Oh, he will. Been married 10 years. I promise he will. <laughs> what happens when she stops? I was married 30 minutes. I promise she will. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was another joke. <laughs> Some of y'all finally caught him. It's all right. It's okay. I don't get enough credit, but I'll, I'll let it go. <laughs> Anyways. So if your marriage is built on anything but the Lord and hope in the Lord and service to the Lord, it's going to fail. It's going to fail. Don't worry, I got more. If your children serve the Lord, that's on the Lord. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm determined. Uh, you don't understand. I'm going, to, I'm going to be disciplined and I'm going to, be, I'm going to take action and I'm going to make them do this and I'm going to make them do that. But if your hope in making your children good is in anybody but God, it's not going to work. I'm not looking for obedient children. Now, they're going to be obedient, but I'm looking for children that are submissive, understand authority, and love the Lord. That's really what I'm looking for. Amen. Loving the Lord, pretty preeminent there. Why? Well, because if, I'm, if my hope is that I'm going to raise good children, I'm going to fail. I failed today. I'm not patient enough. I'm not long. We can just go through the fruit of the Spirit we talked about on Sunday afternoon. You can apply all those. I'm not all of those enough to my children. It's, it's going to fail. If your health is in anybody but the Lord, it's going to fail. Now, it might fail anyway, but because the Lord might let it fail. 
By the way, I'm 30. I'm figuring that out. God's like, ah, oh, no, you don't. That disc, just let that, that bad boy herniate. I'm like, ah. <laughs> but don't worry. If you pray about it, I'll heal you. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. But you're, you, you, listen, you can be a health nut. You can live on almonds and fish and kale. And no, I don't know why you would do that. Homemade kale chips, Pastor, have one. No, I'll knock it to the ground or throw it in the trash where it belongs. <laughs> Look, you can do all those things, but you really, your health is in the Lord's hands. Right. My hope for being able to physically move is not in how much I exercise. It's not in the supplements I take. It's not, it's not in the food I eat. My hope and my health is really on the Lord. By the way, that's why, just, just to let you know, every now and then eat a steak or a dozen donuts. It's up to God anyway. Now, I'm not saying do it all the time. Temperance is self-control. We did talk about that on Sunday <laughs> afternoon as well. Control yourself at times, but I'm just saying, if you're going to live your life only in salads all the time because you think that's going to help you, it's all in the Lord. Your hope is in the Lord. You're going to let yourself down. Other people are going to let yourself down. Anything else you rely on will let you down, but God. Your parents... I know some of you don't have parents, but you can, you can insert your parents, you can insert your children, you can insert your family. Can you double check the car pulling up for me there, Nathan? Thank you. David continues in verse 8, asking the Lord to deliver him from his transgressions to avoid the reproach of fools. Uh, we can read verse 8. It, it, they may have just been flipping around. Uh, verse number 8, let's read that together. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Now, this sounds kind of selfish when we say it, right? Deliver me from all transgressions. So I'm not the reproach of fools. Make it so that I'm not embarrassed. But do you understand, if you're a child of God, and by the way, at this point, David was not just a child of God. He was God's king. He's God's king. So what David was really asking for not, was not just so that he would stay out of trouble and that people wouldn't reproach him, but he understood I am a reflection, I am an ambassador, I am his king, and so any bad reflection on me also is a reflection on him. Any bad, anything bad that comes my way is also bad for God. So he's saying, deliver me from my sins, Lord, so that I don't look bad, so that you don't look bad, ultimately. There's a lot of times I say, Lord, help me not to do something stupid. Not so that I don't look stupid, I don't mind looking stupid, I kind of do it a lot. But so that God doesn't look dumb. So that I'm not an embarrassment to the Lord. So that I'm not an embarrassment of what God is doing. Verse number 9 through 11 can be summarized as David asking for chastening to be removed. Because divine discipline is convicting and all-consuming. Uh, when, when God punished David, it made him feel speechless. He feels like God's hand uh, was overtaking every aspect of his life. He felt completely empty. Let's just read it real quick. I'll try to break it down fast. Verse 9, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. I'm tired of being punished, Lord. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. Man, when you punish, it hurts. When God punishes, it hurts bad. <laughs> uh, when, thou, when thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makes his beauty to consume away like a moth. And, I'm assuming, and, and the best I can understand, he's talking about like how a moth eats away at something. Not necessarily like how a moth disappears. But uh, we don't really, I don't have those problems. But for some reason, I always think of mothballs in like my grandparents' closets and the smell of mothballs to keep the moths out so they didn't eat the clothes. He's saying, man, when, when, you're, when you're punishing God, it's like moths eating away at, at clothing. It just eventually, it's all gone. Surely every man is vanity. He said, God, please stop. Please, please stop punishing me. With that being the description of being under the discipline of God's hands, then I can easily say unrepentant sin will affect you severely, physically and spiritually. Physically and spiritually. No, we think about, oh, uh, yeah, no, I, I, know I, haven't for, I, I know I haven't really repented of that sin. Or, or here's, here's what we'll do. We'll say sorry for it, but we know we're going to do it again, so we're not really repentant. Because repentance is a change of mind that, re 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 that also leads to a change of action. God, I'm sorry for drinking that, so I'm not going to drink it anymore. Oftentimes, we're like, God, I'm sorry for drinking that, but we're not willing to say, I'm going to stop. And so really, we don't get that sin taken care of, and it can lead to, from this description, physical and spiritual health, or uh, unhealth, affected. Uh, because life is vanity or empty, when God punishes you, 
or when God's punishing, David cries out in verse 12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my uh, cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. David begs God to hear his prayers, but notice he knows he's a sojourner in this world. I love that. No, no, read, man, read verse 12 again. Hear my prayers, O Lord. Give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace from my tears, for I am a stranger with thee. I and a sojourner as all my fathers were. You realize what he's saying here? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That's really what he's saying. He's saying, forgive me because I realize that I'm really just passing through. I am a sojourner in this life. I know we can may think that living 80 years, living 90 years, that's a long time. But the reality of it is we are, if you are a child of God, you are not, you are not going to be really, even if you're not a child of God, you're not going to live on the earth very long either, but you are not here. You are just a sojourner. This is not your home. Colorado is not your home. The United States is not your home. Really. You are just kind of sojourning through here to an ultimate home for eternity in heaven. David knew that. I gotta hurry. Each of us should remember that if we have trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, this world is truly only temporary. And well, it's only temp it's not only temporary if you accept Jesus. If if you don't accept Jesus, it's still only temporary. The reality is, once if you die without Jesus, you go to hell. If you die with Jesus, you go to heaven. Verse thirteen is David asking the Lord to let up on chastening him so that his remaining days might be enjoyable. Here's what he says, verse thirteen. Oh, spare me that I may receive, recover strength before I go hence and be no more. Here's what he's saying. Lord, stop punishing me so I can get strong again, so I can be in good health, and I can enjoy life again with whatever I have left, as long as I've got it here. That's what he's saying. He understands living under the punishment of God is no way to live the little bit of life he had left. David felt as though life was too short to live under the punishing hand of God. Some people haven't figured that out. Some people, you see God working in their life. You see God, at least as a pastor, I see it. And I'm like, man, if they just get right with God, they, their life would be easier. Man, their finances would be easier. You say, well, it's going to being right with God, fix your finance. For some reason, when you're right with God and you're living under the stewardship principles that God has laid us with, it really does usually help your finances. Man, their marriage would be better. Man, their children would be better. Man, their living conditions would be better. If they would just get right with God and it's like they enjoy living in it. They can't figure it out. But David said, man, life's too short, God. Life's too short to live like this. I want to be right with you. I want to enjoy the rest of the little bit of life that I have. So a few things and we're done here. Not all suffering is because of ch the chastening of sin. I feel led to say that. If you're suffering, that doesn't necessarily mean God is chastening you for sin. It could. It could. Do I know? No. <laughs> Sorry. Remember, I'm stupid. I said that earlier. I don't know, but God, God knows why you're suffering. And so sometimes suffering is because you think of somebody like Job. Job suffered a lot for nothing of his own cost. They didn't do anything to, to, to get the initial suffering. His wife suffered, again, for no reason. Now, it doesn't say that she was righteous or she was just or she was perfect, but she was married to Job and life was pretty good. So suffering does happen and it doesn't have to be the chasing of sin. But if you are living in sin or frequently committing a sin, it is not impossible to think that your suffering is God chasing your sin. Man, I can't figure out why this keeps happening. Man, I can't figure out why this ain't working. Man, I can't figure out why, how this failed like this. I can't figure it out. Now I'm going to go turn to my sin that I turn to every day, every night, every morning, whatever it may be. No one, not the psalmist or the modern believer, can accept suffering like this without being filled with anguish and the need to pour out their complaint. This is human and it is fine. Uh, sometimes when you're under suffering, it's okay to talk about it. I'm not saying you got to talk about it to me, but at least to talk about it to God. I can be frustrated sometimes when God seems to be punishing me. I'm like, Lord, is this really equal to the, you know, is, is the punishment equal to the severity of the sin here? I'm not so sure. I didn't think it was that bad, but man, you really see, it feels like it's on me. And if you've never experienced that, you're probably just not in tune enough with God. I, I, I mean that seriously, because when you're right with God, you feel those things. You just feel them. It bothers you. In those times, it is important to do as David did, cry out to God, complaining to others, or just, here's, by the way, when you're, if you do decide to talk to somebody else, including myself, don't come to talk to me or come to talk to somebody else to try to justify your sin. That drives me nuts. That seems to be the reason why people want to talk to me. Pastor, it's just I'm going through some things I'd really like to talk to. I'm like, okay, sure. We set up a meeting, we sit down, and it's like for 45 minutes, they just want to justify why they did the things they did instead of viewing them as wrong. And I'm like, yeah, nothing's going to change here. 
because you don't even view what you're doing as wrong. All you've done now is waste 45 minutes of my time. <laughs> so how do you handle that with a lot of prayer? <laughs> God, do you want me to say what I want to say? <laughs> is that what you want me to say? <laughs> None of those things will remove the hand of God's punishment off of you. Complaining to others, just find those sins. No one can deliver you from what God is doing in your life. So are you taking it to the Lord? Or now this is kind of a play on words because he was holding his tongue for a good reason, but I'm going to use it this way. Or are you holding your tongue? Here's what I mean. The worst thing to do when God is punishing you, the worst thing to do is not talk to God about it. Like David did. Remember, he got mad. So I'm not saying a word. Bad or good. Just, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to bridle my tongue. That was the worst thing he could do. He ended up being in turmoil and strife. It built up until he blew up like a volcano. And finally went, Lord, tell me how long I'm going to live so I can just die. And then he came to himself in verse 6. So let me encourage you. Don't hold your tongue if you're going through it. Talk to God about it. It's amazing. I promise. It's amazing how he will reveal exactly what it is. Sometimes he just pops it right in your mind. You go, oh. <laughs> that's in the coming to yourself moment you go I know what I did wrong I better go get that right <laughs> or you know you'll be reading your Bible ab after you pray and it's like God's like bam the exact sin that somebody else is doing in the Bible you're like that's me so the worst thing you can do is not take it to the Lord and to hold your tongue so are you holding your tongue are you holding your tongue what are you living for because life is fleeting Life is vain, and it's verse number seven. And now, Lord, what wait I thee for? My hope is in thee. Is your hope in him? Let's pray.